Hey, it's Junkman from VintageRock.com here at NAMM uh, 2012. I'm uh, here with Lee Dixon, who for many years was Eric Clapton's guitar tech, 30 years in fact. 30 big long years, man, and uh, an amazing ride, an amazing lifetime, 30 years on the road. I only went out for two weeks and they captured me. <laughs> and I really, really loved it. And I'm sad that I'm not there anymore, but as my old pal George Harrison once said, all things must pass. Exactly. You know? Now, a couple of things come to mind first off. One is, um, how did you get the gig above? You know, you, you can think of about a million people would want to be teching for Eric Clapton. And also, how come he didn't change? He kept the same guy for 30 years. Tell us a little bit about that. I think I must have been doing the job right. Plus, we had a, a wonderful personal relationship. And uh, when people ask me, you know, what does it take to be a guitar tech? Well, as I, I was doing a, a question and answer thing earlier, and I, I answered that several ways. You know, the... There are some guys out there who are amazing guitar techs. They're luthiers, they're builders, but they can't handle the road. There's other guys that are incredible electronically, but they don't have a feel for the instrument. Guitar techs were a strange breed. Um, some guitar techs are good enough to go out and play with a band, you know, others aren't. But we all have that love of guitars, and, uh, and my thing is just a, a feel and, and the, the, the wonderful relationship I developed with the artist. Um, so you made him comfortable. I made him comfortable, and that's half the thing. People say, what, what's, it, what's it take to be a guitar tech? I said, well, you've got to know how, a little bit about guitars and a little bit about the electronics, and you've got to be able to do basic things, and you'll pick up things. But half of the battle, or more than half of the battle, is to, maybe battle's not the right word, half, more than half of the task in hand is to make the artist feel comfortable with you, make, make sure he's all, you're always at your station. You're never, ever late. You're always there when he needs you. You, you take care of the studio, you take care of everything, you try and second guess them. And you develop an ongoing relationship and it lasted 30 years. Um, there are a couple of guys I know, Phil Taylor, my buddy in England, who's been working with Dave Gilmore for 35 years, I believe. Wow. I thought I had the record, but he blew me out. <laughs> and there's some other guys, but... Um, it should give you a retirement plan with that as well, you know? Yeah, that, that would have been nice. <laughs> that would, I could have done with a retirement plan. Anyway, I'm not ready to retire. I'm looking That's for good. new artists to work with. I just went to speak to Johnny Highland for a minute, and I'd love to go and work with Johnny, you know, if he could afford Great me. talent, man. I work for Cash, and uh, a wonderful man. So I'm looking for something different to do. I'm living in America now after 30 years in London. Uh, that's where Eric was based all the time. Right. Um, I'm having a blast at the NAMM show. I'm looking at all the new products. I'm looking at all the stuff I can't afford to buy, <laughs> and my wife's going to be glad about that. Uh, I love this thing. You know, it's, uh, it's the most... It's, a, it's strange, it's a trade show, but it's also a freak show, it's a music show, sure. it's a people coming and wearing their craziest stuff show. It's a, it's a and they've all got a common ground as well, too, it's a ground, love yeah. of music. Man. Love of music and nothing, it's, it's never short of interesting. Yeah. Um, and I love being here, I'm very blessed. I'm here with a company called Borns Pro Audio. Tell us about them. Um, they're from the aerospace industry, this is a background, they've been going a long time, very well established company, but they, they, they make parts, potentiometers, and they're linear, you know, the, I always found that the weak link in old guitars or guitars through the years, you buy the best wood, you get the best pickups, the best machine heads, the best nut, the best bridge, and, and you're still using those old parts that have never really changed and designed, and they wear out after a while and they change. Well, this company, uh, through, the, through just stuff that they do and, and make for all kinds of industries, have, have a, a selection of parts, and we tried some of them in guitars, and they just turned out to be so much nicer. Not a massive difference in sound, but the feel of the pot itself, you know, for guys that like to play on, on, the, on the volume control. Right. So I'm doing that. I've, uh, I'm also working with a company called Mojo Tone, great company from North Carolina. Uh, developed some guitar pickups with them. I brought out based on my idea of what a good Strat pickup should, should sound like. We've got two sets called the black set and the brown set for different styles. And you can read all about it on mojotone.com. It's almost like the, like Eric's guitars, Blackie and Brownie and all the rest of those, well, I huh? Couldn't, uh, you know, uh, obviously those were two very famous and iconic yeah. guitars that I handled a lot in my life. And uh, I didn't copy the pickups or anything. I, I just wanted... I like 60 strats myself. Right. I was never a fan of... If I'd given the choice, I'd like a 63, 61, 62, 63, around there. Rosewood board. Eric didn't like rosewood boards. Always liked whiteboards, as he called it, or maple, as we do call it. And um, those are, those early strats, well, Blackie and Brownie, you know, from that era, 57, 58, although one of them, was, Blackie, was a composite of three guitars. And uh, I liked them, but when I, the 60s pickups suited me more. So what I've tried to do with these pickups is try to come up with a way of 
kind of all my favorite guitars in, in two sets of pickups for a Strat. And I'll maybe develop it further and I have some other products I'm gonna be working with them with guitar tech kind of products. So um, that's a fun project. Uh, I'm also trying to do voice work. I, I've been well suited to it and I've always wanted to get into it. And uh, since I'm in Kentucky now, a uh, long way from London. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and a different culture, I must say. <laughs> which I'm, I'm rehearsing, I'm practicing to, to be a, a redneck, actually. <laughs> I'm kind of getting there. But um, I'm very interested in country music. I've watched it develop over the past, well, long time. But, you know, it's not so traditional anymore. There's all these newer bands like Lady Antebellum and well, Incorporate bands. different styles into it yeah, as well now. I like those kind of... You know, those type of bands and, and Bra guys like Brad Paisley and uh, Johnny Highland. I mean, people that have taken it to another level and incorporated. Uh, I think it all started with Garth, uh, Garth, is it Garth Crooks? Yeah, a few years ago when he started doing stadium shows and all the, all the, the, the rock kind of thing right. to it. So I love a lot of that country music. I love the old stuff and I'm hoping to maybe pick up some work in Nashville soon, maybe work with an artist there. You know what? I forgot one more question too. Yeah. How big of an arsenal would Clapton bring out uh, guitar-wise on the road? Like, for instance, did he bring six guitars? Did he bring sixty? Um, we had such a close relationship that Eric would never, you know, he, he would occasionally say to me, "Are you going to bring the Dobro the, on this tour? Are you going to bring the L5?" Or, or, you know, and I'd say, "Don't worry, I've got it handled." I'd look at the album, who we were recording with, and, and not because I was trying to be flash or, or, or supersede my boss or anything, but he was busy with other stuff. And we had such a great relationship, I just picked the guitars. So the blues tour from the cradle, for instance, in the, the early 90s, I would have like 22, 23 guitars, um, maybe about 18 of which we'd use during the set and then a couple of spares for the main ones that were played. And that was a kind of a hard gig because it was a guitar change every song. He didn't want to use wireless. He didn't want to use effects. He just wanted to be on a chord. So you've got to go out there, unplug them, hit the mute, get them back in, get them running, tune the next one, the one you know, tuned up to F open tunings, open tuned 12 strings with capos on them. So you seriously earned your money? I earned my money on that one, but on a normal tour, if he was just gonna be doing his normal set, I'd take, I'd take a couple of jazz guitars, a Birdland and an L5, just for sometimes the sit down set, he'd like to play electric. I'd take a bunch of his signature series Martins for the, the unplugged section, as we would call it, the sit down. And then his main, main stage strats, but I'd always carry a Les Paul in the back there or a, a Tally, just in case his mood changed, you know? And that's part and parcel of being in tune with the artist. You kind of know what they want. Right. Um, one story I was telling earlier, it's a great, great tale. We, we, second time we played at the White House and uh, Eric was playing an acoustic blues, but Lenny Kravitz was playing. Lenny said, let's do all along the Watchtower. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be wild, you know? And Eric had said, you know, we're only going to play acoustic. Don't bother with electrics and, and amps. And with the greatest respect to my ex-boss, you never listen to musicians really, you know, you, you think, he says no, that means he's going to want it. Right. So I took a Strat and a Twin, set it up, and Eric and Eric uh, just played, Lenny sang it, played rhythm with his killer band. And it was one of the most amazing experiences. And everyone afterwards was asking me, you know, what kind of distortion was in there? What kind of overdrive was in there? I said, nothing. Strat, amp, it's all in the fingers, you know, and that's what I tell people. You can buy all the equipment that the artists use, but it's, it's that certain thing that, that their interpretation of playing. It was one of the most amazing songs I've ever heard because he sounded, I mean, it sounded like he was using all the effects that Jimmy would have used, you know? Right. It was incredible. And it went down such a storm because it was, uh, I don't think it was really expected that they would play together. That was amazing. So I always try and second guess the, the musician and always carry extra guitars and, and take a lot of stuff around, which I used to get, uh, uh, the production manager was never really too happy about me taking all the extra cases. But I wanted them there, and when Eric said, man, I would love to play my L5 tonight, but we haven't got it, have we? And I'd go, you had it right there. There you go, brother. And uh, so I had a great time with him. It's so a lot of forethought as well, too. Yeah, and, and a lot of love and devotion into it. I dedicated my life to it most of my life. And uh, now we're apart, and it's, it's gone. It was another time, another era. He's still playing. I'm out here. I wish him all the best, and uh, I look forward to working for a great country player one of these days. So we'll, close to home. <laughs> let's hope that happens, Lee. I appreciate you call it, you talking with us and sharing your stories. I'm sure there's millions more. You know, I could keep you going for days if we had the time, but I've got to go to the Fender booth, and okay. you guys have got to do some more stuff. Okay. But thank you very much for fitting me in. I really enjoyed meeting you all, and I really enjoyed doing it. Thank you. you God bless it. you all. All right, guys. Lee, Lee Dixon, Chunk Man with uh, VintageRock.com, NAM 2012. Hope you enjoyed that, and uh, we'll be back to you later.